Well, I, I, I only play it for the fighting. Seriously, why else would I play it? She kicks away. Nothing sells like sex and violence. And luckily for gamers across the globe, that's just what they got with the release of Dead or Alive. Today, the long-running franchise is a globally recognized fighting game brand with a controversial legacy. From jiggle physics to spin-off games centering around beach volleyball and even special shower scene reward scenarios, Dead or Alive is without a doubt the most bizarre fighting game franchise of all time. Developed by Team Ninja and published by Koei Tecmo, Dead or Alive burst onto the scene in 1996. As you might imagine, the game revolves around the Dead or Alive World Combat Championship, an international martial arts tournament where fighters from across the planet compete for large prizes and a highly coveted world title. While this setup might sound fairly run-of-the-mill, because it is, Dead or Alive was made with a very strategic end goal, to capitalize off of the rising tide of 3D polygonal fighting games. With the release of Virtual Fighter in 1993, the gaming industry could see a massive sea change that was about to happen, and Tecmo wanted to be on board the ship when it left the harbor? I don't know why I'm still doing this ocean metaphor thing. This franchise has nothing to do with the ocean. I guess unless you count the beach volleyball games that we're totally going to talk about in a minute. But back to the story at hand. Tomonobu Itagaki, aka he who might not have eyeballs because he wears sunglasses in every photo, was the man put in charge of trying to traverse this brave new frontier. A grand vista of 3D graphics, hard punches, and because it's a fighting game created in the 90s, bootleg Bruce Lee style characters. Oh, and lots of pretty ladies with responsive anatomy. Itagaki, aka Sunglasses in Chief, put forward a plan to differentiate themselves from the competition in the 3D space. He pitched a path forward that only involved three words, sex and violence. That's it, that's basically the whole plan. Which might sound like a simple design remit, but it was this North Star which guided pretty much every single decision in the process of creating this initial game. Despite it being one of the first games to employ motion capture, it would be another technical leap forward that would come to define the aesthetic and perception of the franchise for essentially its entire existence. The motion capture was making the violence feel real, but the sex in the game needed to be dialed up, according to 2003 Oakley Global Brand Ambassador Tomonobu Itagaki. So, what better way to display the pulsing sensuality of your new favorite MC, Katsumi, than to have her bits jiggle? Thanks to the newly invented dark art of jiggle physics. Yes, literally, this is what they did. They pioneered new technical improvements to 3D animation that allowed every movement of a character to manifest and reverberate in their chests. Itagaki dubbed this technical breakthrough breast physics. For reference, Mai from Fatal Fury had also had her ample proportions subjected to rather extreme amounts of gravitational friction for the player's amusement. But Mr. It's just too bright in here, Itagaki, was picturing something a step further. Gone would be the sprites rendered by hand of yesteryear. Here would be a mathematically accurate and erotically charged movement system, controlled by the player. How could it fail? It couldn't. DOA was a massive success. A massive, heaving success. Aside from the movements on display that lured players in, it would be the stylized combat functionality like the hold button, a deeply Freudianly charged term, that earned praise from critics and aficionados of the genre. A seemingly simple addition on the surface, this hold button mechanic really upended the fighting meta of its day. It would allow you to block and have a reversal. This parry mechanic brought another level of strategy to the fighting game world. It effectively did away with the I'm just going to out button mash my opponent strategy that most games up until this point employed. DOA 2 was released on October 16th, 1999, three years later. Not content to rest on his laurels, Itagaki wanted DOA 2 to be the greatest fighting game ever and also the greatest representation of 3D chesticles ever seen. Thus, he insisted that they develop a general game engine and a breast physics game engine. Literally a separate engine just for the character's chests. You've got to admire the Cory Hart of video games and his commitment to this objectively insane pursuit. Tecmo was not happy with how long the game was taking to produce, you know, due to the two separate engines having to be built and Itagaki's perfectionism, let's call it. 
So allegedly, Tecmo tricked the maestro of gravitational forces into releasing the game. How do they accomplish this? Apparently, one of the managers at Tecmo convinced Mr. Would-Be Men in Black to let him take a build of the game home over a long weekend to playtest it. However, instead of being rapturously transported to a world exclusively populated by kicks, punches, and bouncing tatas, he took it to a printing factory. And Tecmo just released the game as is. Dead or Alive 2 is widely thought of as one of the best fighting games ever produced. I gotta tell you, it was perfect. Perfect. The combat facility was improved, the gameplay was smooth, and the graphics were a massive step forward. However, the future of the franchise was uncertain. Despite the dump truck loads of money being dropped on Tecmo's proverbial lawn because of their golden boy, however, the world's highest shareholder in aviators felt betrayed by his company because they released the game before it was done. But fear not, Tecmo was able to lure the human Ray-Ban back into the fold though, when Microsoft approached them with an even bigger dump truckload of money and an offer to make DOA 3 an Xbox exclusive. Want to guess how this panned out? Yes, there were improved jiggle physics. Thus, DOA 3, the Xbox exclusive, was a massive success, selling over 2 million units. Despite the first two games selling well, the increased spotlight of the Xbox exclusivity deal caused the unavoidable sexuality on display to really enter the cultural conversation in a not great way for Tecmo. In fact, it became the centerpiece of the marketing campaign for the game, and it would be here that DOA's legacy would become infinitely more complex. Despite three fighting games in a row that were released to cries of, this is the best fighting game ever, the franchise would begin to produce spin-off games with less than sky-high goals. That spin-off game franchise? Dead or Alive Extreme Volleyball. All the bouncing body parts you've come to expect from the DOA name, but none of the meticulously constructed fighting tournament narratives you tell yourself that you're there for. Just beach volleyball, gambling simulators, and mini games that consist of you trying to hop over a pool on small square flotation devices. Believe it or not, this game won the Spike TV Video Game Award 2003 category of Best Animation. But was the prize worth it in the end? Because this game, and the, wait for it, two sequels, would eventually forever tarnish the brand by making the franchise seem as a crass commercial attempt at milking money out of fighting babes and their mommy milkers. Okay, maybe that was a bit too far. But these three blatant excuses for having the dead or alive characters prance around on a beach in all their dynamically animated glory weren't the only thing that tarnished the rejected World Series of Poker competitor Tomonobu Itagaki's magnum opus. In 2006, the feature film Dead or Alive was released, and essentially made the franchise a global laughingstock. This one-two punch is something the franchise still hasn't fully recovered from. Sure, you had Dead or Alive 4 being released, again to massive acclaim and sales records, as well as DOA 5 and 6 charting a new direction for the series, one with a toned down sexuality and a corporately mandated push to get DOA into the upper echelon of fighting games. Yes, DOA 5 and 6 are both superb fighting games, but the franchise has suffered a rolling setback of public conflicts over the last decade or so. Chief among them, Itagaki was accused of sexual misconduct, left the company, and then turned around and sued Tecmo, claiming that he owned DOA. These cases ended with Itagaki settling out of court, getting the charges dismissed, and eventually moving on to direct Devil's Third. Is Dead or Alive one of the most beloved fighting game franchises ever? Yes. Is it known outside the gaming community in the way that Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter are? No, definitely not. Ironically, it's the thing that propelled the franchise to such great heights that holds it back from being a name brand here in the West. Sexuality. Americans just don't want to accept the same levels of recreational titillation the way that other countries will. Violence? Yeah, no problem there. We're cool letting our children pump quarters into an arcade machine where a dude literally rips his face off, breathes fire, and incinerates a half-dead combatant. But having gravity work its magic on some body parts? No, that can't be mainstream. Not here, not now, not ever. And this is something that Tecmo has realized and is attempting to course correct. During the rollout for DOA 6, it was very apparent that they were attempting to scale back the sexuality and increase the hyperviolence, and make a serious bid for a spot on the competitive fighting game landscape. Did it work? Only time will tell for sure. But the hardcore DOA fans were not happy with the way the characters were redesigned, the world was made more gritty and serious, and strangely, how Katsumi's new character design was done. Will there be a DOA 7? Will Dead or Alive ever truly be king, or queen, of the fighting game mountain? Only time will tell. 
The only thing that is certain, wherever he is right now, Tomonobu Itagaki is wearing sunglasses. And that's all we have for this episode. What do you think? Is the course correct a good thing for DOA? Let us know in the comments below. And as always, like and subscribe for more videos just like this one.